Good afternoon, everyone. And I just want to thank Michael for pulling this amazing event together over the last three days. We've heard some, we've heard about some amazing research that's happening across uh, Georgia Tech that I know that uh, I had no idea was happening. So it's really great to to hear hear about all of this in in one place. My name is Michael Oxman, and I am the managing director and a professor of the practice over at the Ray C. Anderson Center for Sustainable Business at Scheller College of Business. And we focus on bringing um, sustainability into the classroom. We have faculty who do research, uh, who are uh, Scheller College faculty who do research, some of which you've, you've heard over the last couple of, couple of days that focus on sustainability. And we also have a robust uh, sort of business engagement uh, effort as well. Um, to kick this off, I'm just curious by show of hands, anybody recognize this book? Yeah, that was that was late, Michael. I'm not sure you not sure that counts. Uh, so this is Drawdown, and this is a book that was edited by Paul Hawken, who many of you know has written a number of um, uh, very important books in the environmental sphere, including the Ecology of Commerce. It was the inspiration for Racy Anderson. So those of you who are here for John Lanier's talk um, the other day, uh, he's talked specifically about that that's, uh, spear in the chest moment that Racy Anderson had as a result of reading uh, the Ecology of Commerce, and it also inspired him to turn you know, interface, uh, interface around. So Drawdown, what this book is focused on is the top 100 solutions to reversing global climate change. And so it's very practically oriented, very solution oriented, and it covers the gamut of possible solutions. There's some surprises in there as to things that may or may or not come to, to mind um, uh, right away as solutions that you would think of for addressing global climate change, but there's um, a, a number of things. So technological solutions and other solutions, other solutions that rose to the top, for example, educating women and girls as, as, as one example of that. Um, where this has um, become relevant to the state of Georgia, in addition to having this, this great guide for on a global basis, is that uh, the Racy Anderson Foundation, and Lori was here a moment ago from the Racy Anderson Foundation, uh, they've funded an effort uh, of, uh, focused on Georgia drawdown. So what are, the, what are the top solutions for Georgia in, a, in, uh, in terms of addressing uh, carbon mitigation for the state? And um, this collaboration is happily uh, involves a number of institutions. So we have Georgia Tech, uh, we have Emory, we have the University of Georgia, and we also have Georgia State involved in this effort as well. And so what we're doing is we're essentially starting with this as a menu, uh, taking these 100 solutions, and over time we're going to whittle them down into the top 10 to 15 uh, that are most material from a carbon mitigation perspective for the state of Georgia. The way we've done this is we've organized into working groups, and each working group is assigned from this menu the solutions that, uh, that fit within that category. So we have a working group focused on um, electricity generation, uh, one on transportation, one on the built environment and materials, one on food, and one on land use. And a number of the principals, by the way, are in this room. Uh, um, who are involved in the Georgia Drawdown effort. Uh, Kim Kopp is involved, Beryl Toktai is involved, she's, she's moved over here, and Dan Matisoff, uh, and Marilyn Brown is not here, but she, I think she was responsible for the poster on Drawdown that's outside, outside the room here. And there's a number of others um, who, are, who are engaged in this effort. So one of the things that we did um, that's a little bit different from what was done in Drawdown is we added another dimension, we added a six working group. And that working group is focused on what we're calling beyond carbon. And the way we have defined that is uh, through four primary lenses. So you have these carbon solutions, the vast majority of which are te technology-based solutions. We want to understand what, is the, what are the impacts of those solutions as they affect things like the environment. So if a non-carbon environmental impacts, water, biodiversity, ecosystems, as an example. The next one is uh, equity. How do these solutions affect different parts of the population and in what way? Are they positive impacts? Are they negative impacts? Are they distorting impacts? How are people uh, affected? And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, public health. Kim was talking about uh, air quality. So the air quality benefits of many of these, uh, many of these carbon solutions are, are evident, but there are other public health impacts 
as well that we want to identify, most of which are positive, but there can also be some concerns that we want to flag as well. And then finally, economic develop development and jobs. You know, what is, the, what is the basis for, how will these solutions roll out? How will they create jobs? Will they displace jobs? You know, what, what is the net e economic impact of these solutions, assuming that they're scaled uh, the way we would like them to be at the end of the day? And the reason for doing this is we don't want this, the beyond carbon aspects of this to remain an academic exercise. What we want to make sure happens is that as the 10 to 15 solutions roll out, we want to make sure that those solutions are shaped in a way that minimizes any adverse impacts and that it enhances benefits from those solutions. So let's take an example like rooftop solar. So rooftop solar could well be one of the top solutions. It certainly has a significant carbon reduction benefit, um, but it has other impacts. If you take, for example, the equity lens, low-income folks are typically not able to afford solar panels. That's one possible impact that we want to flag. So what does that mean? Um, not only are they not able to afford solar panels, but they could also end up having higher energy bills because if this was scaled up to the level we would like it to be, the utility is going to put on additional charges associated with the you know, uh, energy distribution and infrastructure and all that sort of thing. And so the folks that have the solar panels are going to benefit. Some of the folks who remain on the grid uh, in the lower income sphere are going to end up having potentially, potentially having higher energy bills. So we want to make sure that that impact is flagged and that when, if the solution is elevated, we're able to shape it in a way such that those adverse impacts are minimized, if not, if not eliminated. Another example might be walkable cities. Walkable cities sounds like a fantastic thing, and it is. It absolutely is a th something to aspire to. But it also, from an equity standpoint, can have um, adverse gentrification effects as well. So how do we create a solution that, again, min that uh, minimizes these, um, these adverse impacts? The other one, and Beryl will be talking more about this in detail, is if you look at household energy efficiency, and in particular, you look at the low-income segment of households in the Atlanta area, and Brett will give more information on this. Just suffice to say that if you were to address the, what Beryl will define as energy burden, the, uh, folks who are spending an exorbitant amount of money as a proportion of their overall income on their utility bill, if you were to, to, to fix that, we looked at just six zip codes in the, in the city of Atlanta, if you were to fix that, you can, um, if you bring them down to the national average, you can uh, remove 350,000 metric tons of carbon. That's just in six zip codes. So if you were to scale that up for the state of Georgia, it could be very significant. So we want to make sure, again, if that, if that is one of the solutions that rises to the top, even if it's not, um, we want to make sure that some of these beyond carbon aspects are incorporated and addressed in shaping the way these solutions are implemented. Um, there's other things that, there's some other enabling themes that come out of our, the work we've done so far. Uh, things like, um, these are enabling features potentially of other solutions. So uh, increasing the participation of women in STEM education and in engineering roles, in decision-making roles. There's some evidence to suggest not only is that just like a good idea for on uh, almost any um, any uh, set of criteria you can imagine, but it also, there's some evidence to show that uh, it has, will have direct carbon mitigation benefits as well. Um, women in decision-making roles tend to make more sustainability-oriented decisions, as, as one example is what the research, is what the research shows. So um, I'll close by simply saying we are at relatively early days in this project. Um, we are open to participation across uh, Georgia Tech and, and elsewhere. If, you're, if you have more interest, you want to learn more about this project, you know, feel free to, to uh, seek me out, Beryl, Kim, Dan, others uh, who, are, who are on the project. You can find the more information on the Racy Anderson Foundation website. Um, there's a Georgia drawdown uh, portion of their website where um, more of this uh, project is, is explained. And I think with that, I'll, I'll close. I would take questions, but I'm not allowed. Thank you.